studio. It is great to be among such wonderful people. I just have one simple question. No, it's just a comment. Any other protesters out there? Come on, you saved yourself for me, didn't you? Little tasty scraps of remaining free speech up here you want to nibble on? Thank you everyone so much for coming out tonight. So, when Lauren first talked about coming to Australia, I thought, hey, I'm going to do a speech about Australia, because you're Australians, it seems appropriate. <laughs> and so I thought, okay, I'm going to start at the beginning. So I looked into the history of the relationship between the Europeans who came in the late 18th century and the Aborigines. <coughs> you know, there's a bit of a controversy <laughs> about this. Now, there's a lot of age ranges here in the audience. So the older people, I mean, do you guys want me to just do a speech? We'll do a bit of back and forth, right? Because you can just see this in the studio, right? So give me some adjectives that you've heard Let's say if you're over 40, like how did you learn about the settling of Australia? What were you told about it? Give me some peaceful, relatively serene, anything. What? All right, what else? Terra nullius. And? Yes, you bastards. Anything else? I think the Black Death is currently outside in a ballot <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, yeah, okay. Now, for the younger people, what have you heard? What has it been? Racism! All right. Yeah, that's kind of what I heard as well. So I thought, hey, let's peel back the leftist adjectives and try and get to some facts. So I went to some very dark and honest sources. And there's some really, really great lessons in this about propaganda, about postmodernism, about how to strip people of the just pride in a civilization they have created out of a desert, out of nothing. There is a lot to learn in this story. Because I believe the West is the best. more than jingoism, for it to be like our team, or, or this flag, or this song, it's got to mean something. Why is the West the best? Give me some answers. Why? Who 
streets, our streets. No, you're not paying taxes. <laughs> Were there any others I missed? I was out there a little bit. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. I'm fucking sick of hearing it. <laughs> so, we have a methodology to get to the truth, reason, evidence, argument, debate, reproducible, empirical experiments, all of the good stuff that the West has produced. Let me ask you a question. If you were to, I don't know, if you know the answer, don't, you know, but if you don't know the answer. <laughs> From about 800 BC to about 1950, Europe and North America was responsible for what percentage of scientific progress in the world? <laughs> See, the ones who are the most certain. <laughs> It's, it's 98%. 98%. I don't know what the rest of the world is doing, but they're not doing science. And we have produced amazing, wonderful things that have changed the entire world. We produced enough excess food to give it to Africa, and then we gave them cell phones so they could find their way to Europe. <laughs> On this one side, we have the West, curious, restless, willing to criticize, willing to, you know, there's a great quote from the great physicist, Richard Feynman, who said, all science is founded on a lack of belief in authority. You are the authority. The methodology is reason and evidence. To hell with those who tell you what the truth is, we must go and find and capture it for ourselves in debate and free speech and reason and evidence. <coughs> the moment somebody tells you what the truth is without telling you how they got there, they're leading you off a cliff. Well, and picking your pockets along the way. <laughs> so, when I looked into the Aboriginal culture, it was interesting. <laughs> and listen, I mean, when a, a culture to me has gone particularly awry, we can look at that culture with some respect to learn the lessons of what happened. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I learned, contrast it with the West, and then I think give you, hopefully something that will give you some goosebumps. So, the Aboriginal culture, and look, I know there's like 600 different bands, there's hundreds of languages, so this is a collectivist statement, I apologize for that, but Leading, leading you through them one by one would be a bit of a challenge. So, so they have this belief it, it called the dreaming. I'm sure you've, you've heard of this. Also known as postmodernism a little. <laughs> the dreaming slash nightmare. Thanks, Frenchies. But um, now the dreaming, it's interesting because the Aboriginal culture has been called the most conservative religious culture in the world, the most conservative. I can't even imagine what kind of police bill they get. I'm <laughs> trying to get the speech. I can't give you a visa from the Stone Age, sorry. Now, they believed, or believe, that the world was created out of nothing, out of the conscience of a socialist. And, boy, that's an existential joke for you, right? Or, or a flat, featureless plain. And the ancient ones, their, their ancestors, they built the world and, and the, the animals, and then they went to sleep under mountains and stuff like that. And the law that was provided to the society from the ancestors could never, ever, ever, ever be changed. It was fixed, it was immovable. They were certain, and they were wrong. 
And that certainty and that wrongness created stagnation, stasis, nothing, no progress, very little change. 40,000 years, is that the latest? I've heard 40, I've heard a little bit more, but 40,000 years. 40,000 years they had Australia, and what happened? They got some great tans. <laughs> And in less than 1% of that time, you have a civilization. Less than 1% of that time. That is something to admire. You know, it's funny because I don't like collectivist pride. You know, like, you know, I'm proud of what European... But you can admire objectively and then add to it. That, to me, is what the purpose of that pride is. Not that you're great because someone else did something, but you can look at that something and say, man, I'd love to add to that. And that's what the admiration is for. Pride makes you lazy. Admiration motivates you to go out and add to the community. <laughs> Do you know how they explain the sun? Do you remember this when you were a kid? Like, I, I still remember this phase. Like, you, you walk around the, the world and the universe and you look at stuff and you're like, whoa. You're like, the Matrix, and whoa. Like, where's all this stuff? Where's it all coming from? And like everyone, they wondered where the sun came from. Anybody know this story? The crane that he knew? So this is uh, some chunk of the belief. I'm sure it varies a little bit. But this is the explanation for the sun. A crane and an emu. Sounds like a worse joke. <laughs> Walking through a bar. Uh, a crane and an emu are fighting over an egg. And the emu egg gets hurled into the sky and it bursts into flames. <laughs> That's what the Sunny said. And, I'm sorry, my, my, my producer said if I did that joke he was going to join the protesters. <laughs> I, I'm not saying I don't understand. But it was my little treasure. I like that joke. Now, the gods, or the ancient ones, said, wow, that's a cool light, we should do this every day, because before, it was just moonlight. Uh, everybody had to hunt by moon. Now, of course, how you get moonlight without the sun? Well, that there were a few kinks in the theory, but because it's absolute and imperfect, nobody has to worry about it. Now, so every day, the gods would say, we've got to do the sun thing, so they would gather a lot of wood, as you do, and they would light it up, and you would have the sun. However, the gods, in their infinite wisdom, could only, would only light the sun when they saw the morning star. Now, sometimes, as you know, it's cloudy. I was out on uh, the Billy Puffing, what's it, the, the train? What is that? Oh yeah, thanks. It's something out of Thomas the Tank Engine, I think. <laughs> you want to get... And, it was like, sunny, rainy, sunny, rainy, sunny, rainy. It's like having hot flashes like menopause. And when, they, when it was cloudy, they couldn't see the morning star. So they would forget to light the sun, and it would be dark, and you'd never have sunlight again, and it would be terrible. So the, 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 the solution was the kookaburra bird. Did I pronounce that right? Kookaburra? Okay, but that's not our bird, man. So the kookaburra bird, would call. Okay, can anyone do a good? <laughs> what is that? that? That is not a good, that is a dance school. I do not want to hear. Anyone do a better? That, okay, that scared me. I guess that's good. All right, so it would be something like that. It's a loud bird. And the gods would then light the fire and you'd have the sun. Now, the problem, so the, the rule in, in some of the Aborigines tribes, the rule was you, you are not allowed to imitate the call of the kookaburra bird. You're toast, man. You are. Ooh, telling on you. So you're not allowed to imitate this bird because the bird might become offended. It won't. You're going to get this. I thought Antifa was going to make that noise as they come through the ceiling. <laughs> so 
swing it in on a chandelier. I think that's too much work. <laughs> so, if you imitate that, then the kookaburra bird will get offended, it won't cry, and then the, the gods won't light the fire, and there'll be no sunlight, and it will be nothing, like darkness till the end of time. So, already you have a restriction on free speech. You can't, ah, or whatever, like you can't make that sound, because it's terrible. The world will descend into eternal darkness, and so they were very, very certain, and they were completely and totally wrong. Now, I have no doubt that over the 40,000 years or so that the indigenous population had Australia, a couple of people, probably more than a couple of people, came along. They were born into these bands or these tribes. And they said, hmm, I don't really get the whole kookaburra sun. Like, that doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. In other words, they questioned. Now, what happens when you live in a society which is both absolutely certain and absolutely wrong, and you begin to ask questions? You're a heretic. You are a blasphemer. You are offending someone, somewhere, somehow. And the penalty is pretty much always the same. It's physical or genetic death. You're killed, you're banished, or nobody will have sex with you. <laughs> It'd be kind of ironic if you made the kookaburra sound while orgasming. <laughs> Everybody would get confused. <laughs> Even the kookaburra bird kind of thing. Anyway. So, they had their Socrates, they had their Aristotles, they had their geniuses who would arise and ask questions. And then they would say, I have an answer for you, it's called this big rock. <laughs> where we will now quiet any questions that disturb the perfect serenity and absolute knowledge that we're absolutely wrong about. Now, philosophy has a, and me too, I don't know about you guys, an uneasy relationship to culture. Because it's not culture that two and two make four. It's not culture that the sun is the center of the solar system. It's not culture that gases expand when heated. This is not culture that's science, it's facts. Now there's some culture which is kind of inconsequential, like I like this food or this kind of dance is cool or whatever, not this one, but you know what I mean. <laughs> so we have culture to represent sort of inconsequential aesthetic preferences, but when it, it's, it's about truth and, and values and virtue and, and the relationship to the gods and honor and respect, then when that culture is based on anti-rationality, it's very dangerous. And this, to Lauren's point about multiculturalism, <laughs> multiculturalism is very dangerous because you have a whole bunch of people all gathered together. They all believe different absolutes that are absolutely wrong. And they don't have a common methodology for resolving those disputes, other than the aforementioned big heavy rock, now called the state. So, the price of shouting down dissent, the price of smashing people who disagree with you, who question the absolutes that for you are unquestionable, is eternal stagnation. Nothing changes. Nothing progresses. The Aborigines had two features that I find somewhat chilling in this regard, especially regarding our circling friends outside. Number one, there was an absolute commandment to share, no matter what. You get a big game, you get a, you know, you share no matter what. And the ancestors and the totemism and the animism, the belief that everything has a soul, the rocks, the trees, the carpet, whatever, meant that you could not change your environment. You could not interfere with or disturb nature even to the point of cultivating 
basic crops. You know, the, the, the Aborigines have to spend like five hours a day just to scrape together 2,000 calories on a good day. There were regular starvations. A, a large number of the majority of children had distinct stalling in their physical growth because they kept running out of food. During times of crisis, they would take kangaroos, they would drive them towards an oasis, and then they would break their legs so they couldn't escape. <laughs> Worst children's show ever. <laughs> and they would do this with sheep sometimes as well, but you weren't allowed to cultivate any crops. And, and when the Europeans first came, and they're like, hey, wow, this soil is fantastic. You know, you, who here has a garden you feed yourself at all? With anything? No, it's got to be more than that. It's Australia. You, you, you guys drop a seed and you get a tree. Like, it's like I have like a, like a 12 by 12 little patch and it's like way more food than my family can eat. It's, it's incredible what you can grow. And when, and when the, the Aborigines first saw it, it was a Fijian missionary who had a, a garden and there was this, well, we don't need to do any of that, you know, the, the gods just provide for us and we don't need to interfere. But, and to me it's like, if someone sails up to your ocean in a giant, incredible sailing ship and they have bang sticks that can shoot something half a mile away, maybe it's time to listen. You know, maybe they've got something worthwhile. Can you imagine? Like some giant spaceship comes down here and people are teleporting all over the place and, and you know, they, they can walk backwards through time and we're like, nah. Not interested. <laughs> we got it. We got a smartphone, we don't need your stuff. Thanks, man. It's crazy. So, they were certain that they were wrong. And that is a very dangerous situation. A very dangerous situation. Because the only way certainty and error can survive is in isolation. In isolation. Because in the late 18th century, as you all know, there was a collision between a culture that was certain and wrong and a culture that was uncertain, the European culture. The culture of humility, the Christian virtue of humility is a central path to wisdom because humility says, I don't know. And those are the three words with which you love the future. I don't know. I don't know. I want to know. And I don't know. That's how we love the future. That's how we build something that lasts. That's how we have a foundation to a civilization that can survive. The Aborigines in general said, we know. We know. The sun is lit by the gods every morning and the kookaburra bird. They, they knew. They had nowhere to go. Nowhere to go. Nothing to explore. They knew. And then you have after 40,000 years, a culture that has the humility to say, we don't know, we're not certain, we'd love to find out. We have a methodology, it's slow, it's painful, it's difficult, lots of stubbed toes, lots of bruised egos, lots of sacred cows don't last, lots of treasured beliefs go by the wayside. And then that culture that has doubt and reason, science, runs into a culture that is certain and wrong, a certain, and has stagnated. So it said there were two beliefs. Number one, the forced distribution of wealth. Number two, you can't change the environment, you can't affect nature, you can't touch it. They were socialists, and they were environmentalists. <laughs> Now, who came up with the idea of the noble savage? You've heard this myth, you know? Boy, back in the day, things were great. No taxes, no clothes, no fluoride, no health care, no food, no birth control. Well, you know, no, there was birth control. It just wasn't very pretty, right? So. No, I'm, I'm like, you know, do, do this infanticide, and, and this is all ridiculously common, in many primitive tribes, including the Australians, between 30 and 50% of babies were killed. 
30 to 50% of babies were killed. Why? Well, often the young girl would get pregnant too early, too young, would not be able to provide for or protect the child, the child would be killed. Here's another cool one, terrible. If you had a child too soon after the child, like you had the child, then you have another child too soon after, sometimes you would kill the second child so that your, if you didn't have enough resources, so that your milk would then feed the first child and make him stronger. If you were promised to a man, and some of the tribes would take babies and promise them to men, if you didn't end up with the man, but you had a child, that child would be killed. Like, this is what lions do. Like, it, it's incomprehensible to me. And here's where the noble savage and postmodernism, the leftism, all combine. Because when you look at the world philosophically, you don't care who is doing the wrong. You only care whether the wrong is being done. You don't look at the color of the skin, you don't look at the gender, you don't look at... it doesn't matter. Now, can you imagine if the Europeans who came to Australia were killing 30 to 50 percent of the indigenous population's babies? How appalling that would be, and it would be. So how is it better if it's the native population doing it to themselves? I'm pretty sure the babies didn't care. Oh, you have the same color skin as me? Yeah, go ahead. And how did they kill the babies? Pour sand into their mouths. They would leave them behind sometimes when moving camp. Dingoes finally get their baby. Oh, it's dark. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sometimes you plan out the comments, sometimes it just happens. Sorry. The punishment tends to be in proportion to the irrationality. The more irrational the belief, the more certain people are, the worse the punishment for defying. For women, it was particularly brutal. And I say this because it, it seems like the feminists may have overlooked some of this stuff in their hunt for the wrong treatment of women, the bad treatment of women. So if you were a woman in some of these tribes and you were accused of disobeying the gods or something, you could either forfeit your life, or you could submit to being dragged out into the bush by the men and gang raped until they were done with you. I kid you not. If the Europeans had done such a thing, or had such a rule, of course it happened, but if the Europeans had such a rule, it would be appalling as it would be. Why is it not also appalling if it's the Aboriginal men with this rule? This is the relativism and postmodernism and insanity that we're expected to believe in the name of some sort of universal moral justice or moral outrage. This is appalling, appalling stuff. The torture is not inconsequential. Young men, in their transition to manhood, would be circumcised. Their front teeth, two particular incisors, would be knocked down. Girls would sometimes have the two joints taken off their finger. Sometimes they would just tie it really tightly until it came off. Another time, other times they would tie it also, they would insert it into an ant's nest. And the ants would eat the tips of the fingers right there. And this process would take, according to the research that I read, this process would take about an hour or so. Or so, that to me, or so. Is that too? Uh, that's a point. The, um, the ritual scarring, you know, you, you cut yourself enormously and then you put clay or ash into the scars to, to raise. It's appalling thing. Appalling stuff. For a young girl promised to be married 
or patrol authority, you know, it was a lot of polygamy, but she would be taken out sometimes into the desert by the women, and she would be deflowered first with something called a digging stick. If this was something that the Europeans had done, it would be appalling. I'm a universalist. I believe that things are true or false. I believe that things are right or wrong. I'm not going to segregate these things by race, by history, by culture. This was some very bad stuff that was going on. And I will not have the only crimes that are ever talked about be from white people. That is straight up racism. And if you trade in, sorry, let me rephrase that. 
If you prefer certainty to progress, it leaves you vulnerable to other societies. You know, in, in a collision between two armies, the most technologically advanced and the most brutal will generally win. But in a collision between two societies, the most curious, the most open-minded, the society that most allows free speech will win because they've progressed. They have a free market. They have free speech. And we are falling backwards through time. We are falling backwards through time. Now we have all of these things that we can't talk about. And where we can't talk about them, we can't progress. We can't get to the truth. We can't reason together. And so we, we hide and we burrow and we mush mouth and we mealy mouth and we pretend that somehow things are going to work out. But they won't. They won't unless, unless, unless we hold on to what got us here. To this evening, tonight, together, to reason together. What got us here? Doubt. Humility and a strict methodology for getting to the truth. Which is knowing that nobody owns it, nobody has it. And it is a very tricky thing to get a hold of the truth, and it is a collective effort. And we must constantly retest the truth. We must take everything we think is certain and resubmit it to the strict requirements of rational arguments, empirical evidence. We can learn from the examples of societies that rejected that process. We can look back through time at societies who said, we're certain, and anybody who asks questions, we were trying to destroy. I make some jokes about our friends outside, but it's primitive. It's primitive. Socialists, environmentalists, collectivists, the postmodernists who say, don't you know there's no such thing as truth? Don't you know there's no such thing as reason? Don't you know there's no such thing as facts? Don't you know there's no such thing as universal virtue or even personal? Every virtue is an opinion. But you're all collectively responsible for what happened 300 damn years ago. Pick one, people. Collective, moral, historical judgments are a moral abomination. <laughs> you are responsible for what you do, for the courage that you take in your daily environment. You are not responsible for the decisions made by others hundreds of years ago. You are not. You are not responsible for the conquering of the continent. You are not responsible for slavery. The West ended slavery. slavery, they said, I wonder if it is right after all. Let's have some doubt. It has been a universal human practice for 150,000 years. As long as there have been people that have been slaves, maybe we're going to revisit that. Maybe it's not right. Maybe the foundation of the West, ancient Rome, ancient Greece, largely functioned on a slave economy. Maybe that is bad. Oh, and you know what the cool thing is? When you get rid of slavery, labor-saving devices become really cool. Because now slavery, the end of slavery means you have to pay for labor, which means you want to invest in labor-saving devices. And that's how we got here. It's beautiful. And slavery is morally virtuous. And you get really cool stuff, too. So the civilization that ended slavery is now the only civilization that is blamed for slavery. That's proving the adage that in a Darwinian world, no good deed goes unpunished. 
The Arab slave trade. Any guess as to how many blacks have killed? <laughs> I'm sorry, you're going to have to be more specific. I'm going to need some fractions. About 100 million. About 100 million. If people are so concerned about colonialism and the destruction and the invasion and taking over, here's a simple thing. What you do is you, you get a list of the top 10 invasions and conquerings throughout the world, throughout history. Just do a sort by death count. And then, cool thing you do is you find out who has the least remorse for these things. You know, when I was looking at the massacres in Australia, I'm like, oh man, this is going to be grim. It's going to be rough, man. Massacres. Ah, oh, it's terrible. They had guns, spears. It's not going to be good. Maybe eight. Matt Bridgeney's died. Maybe. I'm like, eight? Okay, eight is bad. Don't get me wrong, eight is bad. But when the Muslims took over India, it was 80 million. 80 million. And I don't see a lot of hand wringing from our Muslim friends about that. Have you? Oh, they, they, we took over India, 80 million people. The Mongolians, even now, are building statues of Genghis Khan. <laughs> He's our guy. Okay, it wasn't 80, it was only 40 million, but he's still pretty good. Anybody tearing down their statues? No! Because they're not apologizing, because they reject collective historical guilt. Excuse my friends. It's bullshit. Don't take it. Don't take it or you lose it. This is my last point. Thanks for your patience. Is it just me or is it? Oh, a lot here. All right. <laughs> moral guilt and this collective aesthetic horror of the 51 year old guy taking off his shirt. It's alright, eh? I worked out when I was 42. Now that's the kookaburra bird, baby. Alright, so there's an old con in the world. And I apologize to my Christian friends, but it's still true. And the old con is this. You are responsible for something you didn't do. But if you pay, it will have you not feel bad for a little while. So Adam and Eve, nice couple. Unusual tan lines, but but um, you know, then they ate the tree of knowledge, good and evil, and cast down, they became adults, right? Adam had to work, so he couldn't protest. <laughs> Eve had babies, so she couldn't protest. <laughs> and next thing you know, original sin, ooh, bad, you bad, you're gonna go to hell. But if you cough it up, give, give me a bit of money and this imaginary illness, I'm gonna give you an imaginary cure, and Bob's your uncle, right? Wait, did you guys say that yet? Yeah, a lot of Bob's. A lot of Alex's too. Notice that. Anyway, so there's the deal, right? You're bad. It's something you did. Don't take it personally. But cut me a jacket. You'll be okay for a while. Then I'll come back for some more, right? So now, original sin is kind of passe for a lot of the secularists, for a lot of the agnostics and the atheists. So what's the new deal? Well, the collectivist moral judgment is not about Adam and Eve anymore. It's about your rapacious colonialist ancestors who blah, 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 blah. Right, Adam, the, 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 the Aborigines, Adam and Eve, right? I mean, the noble savage, you destroyed it, you mean bastards. But hey, you know what? <laughs> Here's the deal. Just give us some money. And... 
we'll lay off you for about 10 minutes, all right? Is that okay? Otherwise, we'll do the moral equivalent of stick your little finger in that ant hole and <laughs> for an hour or so. But this is the deal, right? So if, if they can make you feel that you somehow are bad for something that happened way back in the past, then you'll feel guilty, right? Because we're whites. <laughs> we feel guilty for everything. <laughs> There was an eclipse, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but it's, and, and that moral sensitivity is kind of why we did this whole, let's do equality under the law, that would be cool. Let's give women the right to sign contracts. Let's end slavery. Let's have freedom. Let's have reason. Let's have a civilization. Oh, and let's try and spread it around the world because that's going to go great. We don't make the world free, but we sure make ourselves a whole lot less free. So we feel bad. If people can convince us that something is wrong, that we're bad, that we did something wrong, we're like a vending machine. You ever have that? Just, I'm so hungry, I don't have a dollar. Wow, it worked. I killed my people. Oh my god. Are you kidding me? This button works? <laughs> resource, resource, resource. Okay, we're just making the money. I've had enough. It doesn't cost us anything. So, this con of you're morally guilty for something you didn't even do, something that didn't even happen, that's the weird thing, too. Like, I mean, you can, you can choose not to be religious if you want, and then the whole story of Adam and Eve goes away. But if you believe this colonial genocide stuff, you can't escape that because you're already sensitive. People who care about people and wanted to write and wanted to win. But we have to... I say we have to stop being so nice, but I don't want to put it that way because I like being nice. It's nice to be nice to the nice. It's a 12th level <laughs> explanation. How about we just stop feeling guilty? How about that? Yeah. How about we just stop trying to save the world and protect what we have? Individual responsibility, personal ethics, moral judgment. We are not the worst people in the world. We are the best in many ways. And everyone knows that. Why do you think the blacks, for instance, are not running to the Muslims to say, you owe us for the Muslim slave trade. Why? <laughs> Any guesses? <laughs> that might not be the longest meeting in the world. I'm guessing. <laughs> Where, why aren't people nagging the Mongolians for Genghis Khan? Because they don't care. They, they think the we won! That's the way of the world! But we're like, oh man, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for all this air conditioning. <laughs> oh man, those antibiotics. Oh god, I feel so bad. Penicillin, Novocaine, books. <laughs> Writing the wheel. <laughs> you little bastards, now you have trains, <laughs> helicopters, the internet. So, you know, the West, Europe, European drags 
civilizations, we've given some pretty good stuff. We care. We give a lot of great philosophy, a lot of great art, science, modern medicine, free market. It's, it's pretty good stuff. And people know that we care. And I'm sure everyone in this room at some point or another has had someone in their life who are like, oh, is this what you care about? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> you know, like, you don't want to say to your torturer, man, it hurts when you do that. <laughs> He's like, really? <laughs> Thank you. So, the only thing that we have to be ashamed of in the West is shame. That is the only betrayal I think that we have made to our ancestors, to our values, to our histories, to the great glories that the West has provided the world. Shame is cowardice. Shame. Unwanted shame. You know, if you do something shameful, okay, fine, feel your shame, be better, move on. But this swallowing, this like hippo with the deep mud of regret and shame and self-attack and I mean it's it's become kind of pathological, don't you think? Like it's become like like the monks bashing themselves with snakes. I don't know, I'm not a theologian, but they did something like that. It's become unhealthy. It has become destructive. Because if we are a tree that rots from the inside out, someone leans up against us and we fall over. And that's not what all our ancestors fought for. I mean, you guys have relatives in the wars. I have relatives in the wars. Many of them died. This is not what they fought for. This shame, this guilt, this constant appeasement with our money, with the money of our children, with the money of debt. Throw it at anyone who screams racist at us. Throw it at anyone and everyone who says that we're bad, that we did wrong. It's appeasement. My God, you think we'd have learned that lesson <laughs> by now? By now, we should have learned that lesson, that appeasement only makes things worse. So, it is time for in-group preference. It is time to circle the wagons. It is time to admire the achievements of the West. says, well, there's these bad things in your history. First of all, hey man, it's not my history. I wasn't there, I didn't do it. How do you justify coming to me when there's a great, there are great evils in the world still currently now that need to be dealt with? And to the people out there who use our virtues as a financial shakedown, that is beyond and beneath contempt. Do not use the conscience of good people. Do not use the conscience of good people to strip from them everything that they have, everything that makes their life worthwhile. Wouldn't you just love to wake up in the morning and feel a sense of peace and pride and calm and hope and future and progress, rather than this sliding and falling back through history, back through time, to primitivism, to certainty, without truth. I think we all want that. I think we've earned it. But we have to let go of the shame. We have to let go of the guilt. And we have to be assertive of the great gifts the West has given the world. Gifts so great that we now are being exploited. And we allow it because, I don't know, it's, it's hard to explain why. I mean, thoughts buzz around my head, sorry? I don't know about the trying to be reasonable thing. I don't know that paying off people who verbally abuse you is being reasonable, to be honest, you know? Like, 
Yeah. It's got this smear of we're going to be responsible, we're going to be nice, look at it now. The world is a Darwinian place, my friends. We know this. And the one thing I do know about Europeans as a whole, <laughs> we're really, really nice. And so we're not. <laughs> England. So in England, sorry, I know this is my last point. Okay, this is my last point. Okay. I flew a long way, I'm sorry. So, um, in England, you've been in England. Okay, so in England, everyone's like, oh, lovely, I'd love to give you a spot of tea, have some crumpets, have some sugar, my back. You step in front of them in a line. Oh, I say, that's a bit much. And then you're getting curb stomped out of nowhere. It's like, but well, you people are so nice. Yes. We were, but then you cut in line. <laughs> and suddenly we remembered why we had an empire. <laughs> and we don't want to get to that, right? And, and why do people lash out? Why does violence escalate? <coughs> violence escalates because you're just not, we're not assertive enough. Tell me any rational methodology by which you would attack Europeans as the scourge of the world. Looking across the span of the world, the span of human history, makes no sense. You've got a class system. Go to India and talk about the caste system. You had slaves. Yeah, who we bought from the blacks. <laughs> <laughs> and we freed. But then we, we don't stop in the middle. Free the slaves. Let Bury the descendants in welfare, create a permanent underclass of people with no fathers. Come on, just in the middle somewhere. We just find the reason in the middle somewhere. But to do that, we have to have doubt. So, the last point I want to make, promise. I promise. You guys are great to talk to, so I appreciate your intelligence. But, we have to get back to doubt. Because right now, I think all too many people in the West are so certain that we're bad. We're so certain that our ancestors did this or that or committed this or did this. We have to get back to doubt. Yeah, yeah, I was taught is a very kind word. <laughs> it's like teaching a cat that is yours by branding its ass with a button. All right. <laughs> it's okay to be bright. So I would say let's doubt the narratives that we're given about the terrible Europeans, the terrible whites, the terrible Westerners. This is, it's just a trick. It's a con to, to get money. It's, it's a shakedown. It's got nothing to do with morals or ethics. The people who accuse us the most, they say there's no such thing as truth. There's no such thing as goodness. But you're bad because... Like, it's just a shakedown. We must doubt the lies we were told so we can fight our way to the truth. Ask for proof. Ask for evidence. And ask how, if proof and evidence is supplied, it is the greatest and least acknowledged infamy in the history of the world. There's an old saying, the guy who robbed banks, you've heard this I'm sure, the guy who robbed banks, Magistrate said to him, why do you rob banks? You know what he said? That's where the money is. <laughs> Hard to argue from an amoral standpoint. Why do you push white guilt? My friends. It's where the money is. Stop paying. Stop paying and it goes away. All right. The West is the best. The West is the best. Have you got one more chance in you, my friends? The West is the best. 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 The the best. To hell with guilt. To hell with shame. Pride, admiration, adding to the treasures that we inherited, that's how we came.
That's how we have a future. That's how we have certainty that comes out of the doubt about our shame. And I thank you so much for your time tonight. I appreciate it.